Welcome. And we'll start off with Baruch Atah, Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Hey. And uh, here we go with the share. And we're on to a new subject today. Relatively new subject. It's not a completely new subject because we are still dealing with priests and the limitations they have. And in this case, though, we are going to be talking, I believe, about the animals that are uh, the priests themselves and then subsequently the animals. In other words, the idea is to try to make it as perfect as possible. And while I know that generally speaking, we don't necessarily seek perfection, the truth is that there are places where if it's substandard, we're not interested and we in fact would reject it. Um, you know, you go to a concert, for example, uh, and if the person isn't competent, uh, you know, I'm not saying you're going to boo them, but certainly you're not going to go back to that concert and you're going to feel that somebody took your money for nothing if, if in fact it's a professional individual. And I think that goes for quite a number of situations like that um, where there is a sense of standards and, and to be able to make those standards. And I was thinking, for example, uh, if you're dancing or acting, the directors can be very, very hard on you. And I also remember uh, Susie, my wife, telling me about going to art class, where if they presented something, they could have spent hours on something. And if it was considered substandard, uh, the teacher could just tear it up. Uh, uh, it's sometimes being that tough is important in terms of developing uh better better standards and working harder so just just interesting <clears throat> but being able to of course handle criticism is so important as well uh so there's tv is a reality show that we watch which involves fashion very very tough standards are very high well by the bear hashem l or shelay more so hashem spoke to moses to say, Daber el Aharon Lemur, speak to Aaron, saying, Ish Mizaro, a person, a man of his seed, of his offspring, excuse me, Mizar Acha, forgive me, I read it wrong, a man of your, so he's speaking directly to Aaron, a man of your offspring, the Dorotam, according to their generations, so this means in perpetuity, essentially. Asher ye vomom, in whom there is a blemish. Lo yikrav, he shall not draw near. Lahakriv lechem elokav. That is in order, we're talking specifically of what we mean by drawing near, and that is to offer up the lechem. We know that lechem generally is translated as bread, but as Rashi is going to tell us, that word lechem can also mean food, food or a meal of his God. So in other words, it's going to be a definition of what kind of blemishes we are talking about that render a priest um, unable to, from, uh, from uh, offering up, from ministering at the altar. So uh, Rashi here, Lechem Elohav, leaf, the bread of his God, Ma'achal Elohav. So he's saying the, the food of his God and we read this yesterday, uh, every meal, a su'uda is a meal, is also known as a lechem, as in the book of Daniel, we mentioned this too, avad lechem rav, he made a great feast, he made a feast, lechem rav, a great meal. Now, ki chol ish asher bo mum, because any man in whom there is a blemish, Lo yikrav, and now he goes on to explain what are we talking about. Shall not draw near. Ish iver, a man who is blind. Or piseach, uh, piseach means a limp that he has. Or charum, so charum is a word that we have to look at the tradition to understand, but it means flat-nosed or sarua or who has 
limbs that are not of equal length. So we're talking about quite serious defects here that uh, or blemishes here. It's going to go on with others as well. Let's just take a look at the Rashi. <clears throat> For every person in whom there is a blemish, lo yakikrav should not uh, draw near or should not offer the sacrifice. Enodim sheikrav. Okay, uh, so it means here. Here, well, the way Rashi's dealing with this is trying to explain what appears to be a redundancy. And it's, it's as if this sentence is saying, it, it doesn't, the sentence is justifying the statement that was made before in the sense that it enodin sheyi krav means it doesn't make sense. You know, that's, that's what it's uh, getting across, that it doesn't make sense that a blemished, someone who's blemished and subsequently a blemished object should in fact be making gifts in this kind of context. For example, and he gives an example in the prophet Malachi chapter one, hakrivuhu na lepachtecha. So he, opachtecha. Malachi is talking <clears throat> about the, the way in which uh, the Jewish people at his time are worshiping and doing it in ways that are objectionable. And basically part of the, um, the style of Malachi is that they'll say, well, what's bad about that? And Rashi here is, uh, excuse me, Malachi is saying to them here, okay, you're, he's accusing them of offering up blemished animals on the altar. And, and he's saying to them, why don't you take that blemished al animal and give it as a gift to your governor? See how happy it's going to make him. Because, of course, there's an insult. When you give someone something that is blemished, then it's the, the connotation of the gift is very different than when you give someone something that is as perfect as you can make. It's part of showing respect and love at the same time. Is the name. So, so gift giving is actually a very subtle um, way of communication. And as I said, if you give someone something that's secondhand or whatever, of course, it depends on the general context of what you're doing. But if you're trying to make the gift something to demonstrate your love and your respect for that person, you don't give them blemished objects. Um, best example you had was Cain and Abel, where the implication is that Cain simply gave whatever came at hand. Um, and uh, the amount of trouble in a way that you take in making the gift is part of part of it as well. And, and there's a famous story about Stanley uh, in Africa uh, that when he left, there was a, a person there who brought him a carved piece of wood. And Stanley at the time knew that they didn't grow that kind of tree in the locality and that it was grown a hundred miles away. And he said to the person, he said, he said, where did you get this? This is, you know, this is, um, something you had to walk a hundred miles to go get the wood to make this carving. And the person said to him, walk part of gift. So we do have, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so Harum, Harum, uh, in Bechorot, in the tractate Bechorot, page 44, it says Shechot Mo, that is the Chotem uh, means, uh, it could mean his, I'm trying to think exactly how to, to uh, describe it, but it's like the bridge of, I think it's like either the nostrils or the bridge of the nose. Shakua is sunk in between the two eyes. So in other words, it's, it's closed in and um, literally it means he can paint his two eyes in one, in other words, when he's putting um, mascara on or eyeshadow or something like that, uh, it, he can paint both eyes in one brush stroke. Sarua, she'echad me'evarav gadol mechavero. So it's saying that one of his limbs is bigger than the other limb. Eino uh, achat, or one eye, gadola, eino achat, or one eye is smaller than the other. 
this, so this is the basically point about the word sarua, or, and he gives another example, shoko achat, one of his thighs, arucha mechaverta, is longer than his other thigh. So sarua means that kind of, that kind of blemish. We are not done. Here we go. O ish asher ye vo shever regal, or a man or person who has a broken leg, so a limb that is broken. And uh, we'll see what Rashi has to say about that, or shever yad, or whose, whose uh, hand is broken. Let's take a look. Okay, so there's no Rashi on this. Um, I, I had read elsewhere that this here, we're talking essentially about a, a temporary kind of situation. And the question is asked in halacha, well, what if it heals? And the answer is that the wording here, the way it's worded, suggests that if, if he has it, then he can't do it. But if in fact it heals and he no longer has this problem, he's fine. He can go ahead and perform the normal services of a, of a priest. <clears throat> We're going into further possible blemishes. O igibain. So again, these words are not used very commonly. They're not common words. Uh, I think the Safaria translation had, uh, I'm not sure, let's take a look. It could be, uh, yes, this is, I believe, Rashi's interpretation. And I think this could be Safaria's translation. Quite a bit of difference here in the translation. So you can see this, right? So Rashi translates it as heavy eyebrows, another possibility. And I think this is the modern use of the Hebrew, hunchbacked or duck. Uh, uh, the translation in Safaria is a dwarf, but um, Rashi has a different, you'll see, has a different translation. Or... Tavlul uh, be'eno, or a tavlul in his eye. It's a kind of growth. O garav, a boil scar. O yalefet, or scurvy. These are obviously different kinds of uh, skin, skin afflictions. O maroach ashach. Or, and this has to do with if his testes are crushed. So. All kinds Asher, of yeah. yeah. Okay. Asher, sorry, thank you. Maruach Hashech, direct. I mispronounced it. Let's take a look at uh, Rashi, quite a bit of Rashi on this particular section here. Okay, Giben. <clears throat> and this is some kind of French words, or maybe, uh, Lauren, do you have uh, an English spelling of this word? Yeah, S O U R. C I L S or C. Sourcie. Sourcie. No, Sourcie. S O U R C I L S. Oh, yes. Sourcie. I'm sorry, I thought there was an E after it. Okay, Sourcie. You can kind of see how it's spelled there in, in French, in this old French. And it says Eugen Breunen. And that would mean heavy eyebrows. Eugen, la eyes. Breugen, uh, Breunen. French, it would be be Oigen. above the lashes. Yeah, yeah, right. So, shegevine enav, he says in the Hebrew saying that the, the um, yeah, okay, the lash, that's right, the lashes of his eyes, I think I said eyebrows. It's no, it is eyebrows. Okay. Above the lashes are the eyebrows, and that's what sourcy means, ah. above the lashes. Okay. Oh, I so see. So the eyebrows. Okay. All right. Uh, so he says, Gvine enough. So the Gvine enough have to be the eyebrows, the, the brows of his eyes. So Aran, their hair, Aruch Vishochev, are long and lie down. And li literally, it means they lie down. So, O Dak, and this word Dak, Bechorot, and in the word Bechorot, the tractate Bechorot, page 39, Sheyeshlo Be'enav Dok, that in his eyes, there is something that is called a duck, uh, which I looked up the translation, Jastro says it's a withered spot in the eye. And also, or like there's a web across his, I imagine across the pupil. Shekorin Tia, you'll have to help me with the- uh, A cataract? Yeah, um, I oh. mean, 
Yes, the Chabad yes. calls it a cataract, and it says yes. the eyes over ha, over his eyes is a membrane. But the as far as then those words, it actually lists four of them. Interesting. The first one is tail, T E I L E. That's the this second, word here. Yes. The second one, tell, T E L E. Yes. Then toil, T O Y L E. Yes. And then it, for some reason, repeats T E L E. So I'm wondering. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If that's a mistake, yeah, why mm -hmm. have that twice? Right. So the Yiddish is ein a dinis a thin gewebt a thin web. So it does sound like a cataract. Kamo mm -hmm. and here in Yeshayahu in Isaiah, hanote kadok. It's referring to the heavens, I believe, spread out like a web. Oh, and we're going back into explaining the text, tavlul, right? All these words require explanation because they're just uncommon words and they're describing very specific disorders. Davar sa tavlul, he says there's a derivation from davar ha bel, something that uh, confuses, right? Et ha'ayin, the eye. So something that makes eyesight, uh, you know, pr problematic. Kagon, so for example, he says, chut lavan, a white thread, hanimshach min halavan, that goes on from the white part of the eye. Uposek besira. And I think what this means is that it, it divides up, it crosses over in some way or another. Shehu agul, and um, it is round. Hamakif et hashachor. So this is the iris. This is the iris that surrounds the dark. That is the pupil. Shekorin prune. That is a modern French word as well, which means I think the iris. De it says here prunel. Okay. All right. So this is like prunilo, prunilo. And, and I think and it's referring to the pupil according to it this. Is really? Okay. Yeah. All right. But I think that he says this is a makif. Makif would be to surround. Uh, so, but it could say that the shachor, the dark part, the pupil, is called the pru, pru as you said, the prunel. So, That's what it says here, yeah. Oh, well, here we go. The der Eugen Apfel the apple of the eye. So that would be the pupil. Eugenstern, or the star of the eye. Eugen, of course, is eyes. And this thread, posek et ha'ogel. And this thread splits up, divides the ogel, this round part. So here he does mean the iris, I believe. That is the circle. Yes. And it enters into the dark, into the pupil. The Targum Tavlu, and the Aramaic translation of the word Tavlu, Chiliz, is the word Chiliz. Lashon Chilazon. It's referred, it's, it's a. Um, um, mine, by the way, says Tivulal. Oh, as really? in. And then it says, as in, it looks like Tili, uh, Chilis. Yes. Derived okay. from right. Chilis. 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 Right. Zone, so yeah. There's the word, Tavalu. And I, I said Tavlu. So I'm Tavlu, doing a yeah. great job today of mispronouncing words. Tavalu. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, thank you for catching me. This is Tavulal. Right. But here it's Tavalu here. Huh. So let me look at the, at the rush oh, yeah. here. And see if it's it would be spelt a little different differently. Okay, so here look at this taf bet lamed vav lamed, and this is taf bet lamed, and this is an u sound here lamed. So, you know, I I want to go then with the way it's pronounced that he's referring back to the word in the text, which is at least here the way it's been spent spelt is tavalu. Yeah, actually, now when I'm looking at the Hebrew. 
part of the Rashi, it does say it that way. But mm -hmm. in the English translation of the Rashi, it lists the Hebrew characters differently. So mm -hmm. I would trust Tival, uh, Tivalul. Right. <laughs> it, could be, it could be that, uh, you know, again, it's a misprint. So the translation of it is Chiliz, Lashon Chilazon. It has the same meaning as the word chilazon, shehu dome le tolat, because the chilazon was this worm that could split rocks. If you place this worm on the on a rock, it would split. This is uh, in the agada, agadic material. In other words, because the the you couldn't actually wield iron on the rocks on which. Uh, the temple was built you couldn't because iron is a symbol of warfare so they have this story of the chilazon that that's the way they did it so um yes uh, there was the uh, tales of solomon by i yes, think exactly. Riha, that i must have read my 900 times yes um wasn't it called the shamir yes you're right that's you're right i think it was, was well maybe i'm wrong I'm making a lot of mistakes today. Uh, you know, now I'm thinking- but that, It does say it's a worm. Yes, but now I'm thinking that the chilazon is the- um, A different worm. The, the, yeah, that it is, that that's what you get the blue from. That's, I'm con I was confusing it with the-, with the um, Oh, that would make sense with this word. Yes, the chilazon, forgive me. <laughs> You, okay, you, you get the prize today, Judith. Thank you for catching my, my error. Right. The chilazon was what they made the trailet from. That's what. And the shamir was the, worm, was the worm that they used to split rocks. Thank you. Thank you for making sure I didn't make that mistake. All right. Um, so let me keep going. Um, find the place. Right. It is a worm or to. Uh, uh, yes, otohachut. That 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 uh, thread looks like a worm. Vechen kinuhu chachme Israel, and and so the sages of Israel uh, termed it the mume habachor amongst the um, the um, imperfections, all right, or the blemishes of a bachor. So a bachor. So if in fact, so the Torah says that if the if a firstborn animal, which was supposed to one of the firstborn animals that was supposed to be de dedicated to the temple, had certain blemishes, they were not they were not offered as a as as a, a sacrifice. Chilazon uh, nachash. Um, well, this is enough. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Hush, a love. This is a lamed. Sorry. A, 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 mine says a enough, enough. 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 Thank you. Sometimes you can see. Sometimes a a, a lamed has that little part not printed, and so it's hard to to tell. So right. So nachash would be a snake, right? The snake of his eye. And again, this is why it's in the tractate Bechorot, because it's discussing blemishes. Uh, that would render an animal unfit to offer as a bechor. Garav v'yalefet. So these words, garav v'yalefet, minei shchinheim. He says they are types of boils. Garav, so the case of a garav, zo hacheres refers to, so cheres refers to like clay, hacheres, shchin, Right, this is uh, dry, a dry boil, a mi bifnim, which is dry on the inside, umi bachutz, on uh, and outside as well. So this would be a, a dried boil. Yalefet hi chazazit. So he says a yalefet is like a chazazit hamitzrit, Egyptian lichen. The lama ni create yalefet. So why is it called? Why does it have this word yalefet to describe it? Shemela pefet v'holechet ad yom hamita, because it clings to the skin and continues to do that until the day of death. It's a permanent, a permanent blemish. 
Vahu lach mi bafutz, and this is one that is wet, moist on the outside, v'yavesh mi bifnim, and it's dry on the inside, uvamakom acher, and in another place, korel lagarav shchin, he calls the garav shchin halach, uh, sorry, shchin halach mi bachutz, v'yavesh mi bifnim. It calls a garav, a garav, a boil, which is moist outside, v'yavesh, and dry on the inside. So that's as opposed to the alefet, I, I imagine. I'm looking to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the question of how to define the garav and the alefet. Shinemar, Mar, so based on this, is in, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 28, it says, Uva Garav, Uva Cheres, because there where it's talking about the plagues that are going to occur to the people if they don't follow the Torah, it describes, it uses the term Garav and Cheres. And Cheres, we know, is has to do with like pottery. Keshesamuch. Garav Eitzel Cheres. So he's he's saying now the way you understand is when the word Garav is placed next to the word Cheres, Kore Leyalefet Garav. In that case, Leyalefet is also called a Garav. Ukeshehu Samuch Eitzel Yalefet. But when the word Garav is, uh, yeah, I'm looking to say, when it's next to the word Yalefet, Kore Lecheres. Garav. Then, it, then the dry boil is called a garav. Kach uh, mefurash. Well, it says when the word um, her, I think it says when the word keres is placed next to yalefet, you call it a garav. Let me look at what the Rashi said. That's that's the translation here. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. You're okay. So here, yeah, got, okay. Korela yalefet garav. And when this word, I, we're talking about the word garav, right? When the word well, the garav, first, yeah, the garav. The first one is when the word garav is placed next to the okay. word keres. The right. second one is when the word garav. Yalefet is placed next to keres. That's what mine says. And then that's also called a garav. Hmm. Okay. I could. Uh, so see. what's okay? So here's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Here's the word garav, and then there's the pronoun referring. And generally, I would think the pronoun would refer back to the closest, the closest uh, reference. So when it is placed next to yalefet, korel cheres garav. Well, but so maybe so it's what, saying the word cheres. Yeah, go what ahead. What mine says is, however. Mm -hmm. And this is after when, okay, so the first sentence is Charis near Garav. Then it says, however, when it uh, is mentioned alongside Yalefet, then Charis right. is, is called right. Garav. Right, that, I would agree with that. Oh, okay, yeah. I get you. Yeah. So it's like, No, yeah. I was wrong too. I was wrong. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it's referring ultimately to the word Charis and where it's placed. Right. Uh, Kach so this is the way it's explained in the tractate uh, let me see we can just we have a little bit more just to finish off here because this is, right, yeah, let's get this of course we don't want to miss that right so according to the aramaic translation so that's the way it's uh is uh translated in the Aramaic, the pachadin or the testicles, maris would be crushed. Shepachdav merusasim, his testicles are crushed. Shebeitzim shelo, and literally it says the eggs, it's eggs, right? Are ketutim, are pounded, right? That they're- Yeah, mine says the sinews are knit together. Okay. Well, but either way. So maybe they're understanding pachadav as sinews. Is that how they're translating? Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. No, sorry. I, I, look at it. In the, here's my translation. Look at that. So he says, he gives the example in Job chapter 40, where it says, gide, gide are sinews. Gide pachadav yisro, yisorgu. Yish, yish, yeah, and mine says pachidav. Okay. 
It could but be. But you may be right. No, no, no. Okay, they could be right. I'm, there's no yud here, which is why I didn't say the chida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there had been a yud there, I would have. So it I says, so the verse in Job is the one that says, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going to leave it. So mm -hmm. basically, we're talking all about this. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So they had to check for all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I imagine they did. Well, they were guys looking at each other, but there's also a sense, you know, of a medical way in which to look at these things. So I'm going to stop the share. And uh, we can stop the recording and we have a minion.